Great. Well, my name is Jordi Izzard, and I'm an alumni relations officer here at SICE in Washington, D.C., and today's date is January 17th, 2013, and I'm here with Marvin Ott, who is currently one of our professorial lecturers here at SICE, and he's also uh, an alum with a master's degree from Washington, D.C., in 1965 and then went on to get his PhD here at SICE and uh, received that in 1971. So thanks so much for being with us here today and we'll just kind of have a little bit of a conversation. And why don't we start with what originally brought you to SICE? Okay, I might mention it. <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, I apologize for my voice because I've got congestion. No problem. You will hear. Um, I might also just mention that currently I'm also teaching undergraduates at Homewood in Baltimore, Terrific. so Great. that may color some of the comments I make later on. Uh, what brought me to SICE, uh, basically I was a kid at a small liberal arts uh, college in Southern California. and uh, What was the name of the school? University of Redlands. Okay. And I'd done pretty well, and so my graduate school opportunities seemed to be, you know, a lot of possibilities. I was inter interested in international affairs um, and at that point applied to two places. One was Yale, mm -hmm. uh, the other was SICE. Um, I was admitted to both. I had full scholarship support because uh, this was a, these were the days when there was a lot of sort of foundation and government money available to support people like me. So I, I had a free ride. Um, I chose SICE, uh, it was, I actually thought it through briefly, and uh, the reason basically was that I felt like I had spent an awful lot of time in the library uh, and I needed to break out of that and get into an environment that was at least partly operational, partly public policy, partly engaged with the real world and not just another three or four years in the library. Mm -hmm. And I thought at Yale I'd be in the library. And I had actually had a, a classmate of mine, Les Janka, who if you haven't interviewed you will want to at some point, mm -hmm. uh, who, had, who had found SICE and had preceded me. And that was uh, sufficient for me to make that choice. I mean the picture I had, which I think was accurate, was that SICE was more of a professional school and a place that would get me, where I could start to get my feet wet in the real world in a way that a purely academic program at a place like Yale, for example, might not. Mm -hmm. And so that was the reason. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And you were here in, I guess, 1964 is when you started, or was it 63? 63. And tell us a little bit about what your experiences were here. Well, without you know, so going down memory lane, it, it, it's sort of painful detail. But also, I won't, most of it I've forgotten. So, uh, but at any rate, uh, I guess a couple of dominant impressions. One, SICE at that point had just moved into its current building. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of in the process of sort of establishing itself kind of for the future. There was still, it was a small place. There was still, I, I thought, a kind of palpable sense that SICE was kind of a work in progress, that they were, it was still kind of establishing itself institutionally. Um, you had a relatively, you had a small faculty, not unlike today, I think, a sort of a core group of kind of senior guys, I think they were all guys basically, except for the language program, uh, who were sort of, they were SICE. And, uh, a group of students, pretty diverse, um, people like me who were kind of oriented towards trying to do something in the real world, uh, very bright. So it was, it was, there was a little bit of a kind of, we're kind of making it up as we go along here, uh, but at the same time you had the sense that it was a, a place that really had a future. A um, couple of dominant impressions, um, one um, was the, basically the template that SEIST used for its curriculum. And at the time, I basically just took it as a given. In retrospect, it was pretty distinctive. And that was SEIST at that time taught international affairs from a realpolitik, geopolitical, 
realist perspective, and that basically meant Hans Morgenthau as the text, Robert Osgood, Arnold Wolfers was still uh, around and active at that point. They were sort of, the, they were the brain trust that established this is the way science <coughs> sees the world. And so that's what I, I, I acquired, mm -hmm. and I've never regretted it. I thought uh, uh, it stayed with me. I, th I think it has applications in some situations and not in others, but in the area of the world that I chose to focus on, East Asia, it works beautifully. And, and I mention that because that was not an eternal template. I mean, in, in years subsequent to that, SICE took on different templates. But at that time, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was, that was a strength. Uh, I guess one of the last two quick things, uh, in terms of personalities, the ones that stand out mm -hmm. in memory were Isaiah Frank and mm -hmm. Robert Osgood. Mm -hmm. Also, Francis Wilcox as the dean was a very sort of convivial, benevolent sort of presence. Uh, but those two, Frank and Osgood in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, greatly respected, uh, I will say even loved, and in both at the time and in, and in memory. Um, the other memory I have is personal, like this is where I met my wife, mm -hmm. so my fiance and uh, got engaged and so on, and that was as uh, students here. Mm -hmm. Terrific. <clears throat> then now you've graduated in '63, or I'm sorry, '65, and then did you take some time off be before your PhD, or did you just go right into the PhD work? No, I, w I went right into it, and this is um, a point of contrast with the present world. I mean, I, I'm struck. I'm now teaching Sci students. Um, today, and I know this has been true for quite a while now, it is a, a relative rarity for someone to do what I did at that time, which was quite normal, which was BA, MA, PhD, bang, 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 mm -hmm. right in, no break, straight through. Um, and now, I, you would know, I don't know for sure, but the entering age for somebody whose size is like 26 or 27. Correct. Yep. They've done several things, probably overseas, for several years after getting their BA. Uh, if they go on for a PhD quite frequently, I'm going to guess there's another break, other more activities, work for the you know IMF or something like that, come back to get your PhD. Uh, but but in though in, in in the days that we're talking about here, 60s, 70s, uh, that was less typical. Mm -hmm. And because I had full full scholarship support it was easy for me to just basically stay right mm -hmm. on track. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other comment I'll make is just as a sort of personal memory. When it, when I finished my MA and it was and I knew I was going to go on for a PhD, I hadn't frankly given it a great deal of thought as to why. I just in my gut it told I had always assumed that that's what I would do. Um, I apply. I was by this time in the Southeast Asia program had that as a geographic specialty. The center of Southeast Asian studies at that point was Cornell, and I applied to Cornell uh, for the PhD program, and I was admitted. And uh, I talked with the then longtime head of the program, George uh, M. Kahn, K A H I N. And um, what I ran into there was Cornell's internal rules would require me to do an extra year of coursework. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Kayan was sort of apologizing for that and saying it's really dumb and I'm going to try to use your cases to make the case that it's dumb and so on. But for me, it wasn't, you know, that was a non-starter. I saw no reason why I should repeat a lot of courses that I'd already taken. So uh, my other option, the only other option I'd really gone for was to stay at size. So I did that and that worked out fine. That's terrific. Well, we're luck lucky to have, have you be here. So... And then in 71, when you graduated with your Ph.D., tell us about how your career got started and how it's evolved. Well, <clears throat> without um, sort of, you know, old guy doing long sort of uh, soliloquy on his career, I'll, let, me, let me just make uh, what, what I think it would be distinctive or sort of worth noting about it. Um, and I find myself, I'm doing sort of some career this is what it's like to work for the federal government in various capacities and so on for undergraduates 
at Hopkins in Baltimore, so I'm sort of sensitized to this. I remember, as I told the students, I remember years and years ago sitting on an airplane reading a magazine, and the article was about the professional career of the future, and the author stated, the professional of the future can expect to have seven different careers, sort of seven mm -hmm. significant breaks and restarts, different, different direction. Uh, and I said, well, I've counted it up. I've had eight. So that, I was, you know, kind of right on, right down the middle of the fairway. And so for what's distinctive about it is I, st I got, my, let's say, my Ph.D. at SAIS. Um, I remember the first uh, time I was in this building, or in the, the NHTSA building. It had just been opened. It was the summer. I was in Washington as a State Department intern. And I wanted to go over and see the building, where this is where I was going to be a graduate student. And I and the building was probably two thirds empty, and they were still moving stuff in. And those construction people were still doing stuff. But I remember going by an office, and there was a faculty member in there, and he says, "Oh, come on in." He saw me going by. Long since deceased, uh, a very uh, interesting personality. His name was Paul Leinbarger. Mm -hmm. Um, about Paul. East Asia, East Asia <laughs> program. He's a China guy. And so, come on in. And so I remember sitting with him probably for an hour and a half. <clears throat> and um, the one thing I remember from that conversation that stuck with me was, in effect, son, the best career is one where you can put one foot in the academic world and one foot in the policy world, and you can step back and forth between those two. And I remember thinking at the time, yeah, for me, that sounds right. That's what I want to do. So in a, that's my prologue. That's essentially what I've done. So I was in the, I was actually in the Foreign Service. I passed the exams and admitted, admitted and all mm -hmm. that. While I was doing my doctorate, because the doctoral program was going to take longer than the Foreign Service allowed, I was put on leave without pay. I uh, can't do that anymore, but you could do it then. Uh, so I was so I start off in the Foreign Service. I get my PhD. I meet my my bride. Um, I decide this is not going to work in the Foreign Service. She's in the PhD program at SAIS. Two PhDs. You know this, this is not going to work. So I then resigned from the Foreign Service, became an academic, Mount Holyoke College, there for six years. Uh, M meantime finishes her PhD, which is longer than we expected just because she's a perfectionist. But anyway, we got it done. That's an all-women school, is it not? not Mount Holyoke, yes, Yeah, it that's is. interesting. Yeah, okay. One of the original seven sisters. Mm -hmm. Which for a kid from Southern California where no such institutions existed was, you know, kind of interesting. It was, mm -hmm. it was, it was something that... Anyway, mm -hmm. I like I Mount Holyoke a lot. Mm -hmm. But we had agreed that once M got her PhD done, we would come back to Washington because this is where this is where the action was for what we were interested in. Everything was here, um, and besides that, a you know, place like Mount Holyoke in those days was basically a starvation wage on the faculty and you know mm -hmm. so on. But anyway, so we then come back to Washington. So I end up on Capitol Hill at something called the Office of Technology Assessment, which I'd never heard of before. Mm -hmm. It was a newly minted congressional support agency. It turned out to be Really, I can go on a great length, I won't. It turned out to be a great place to be. I uh, did that for another six, seven years. I uh, wanted to get back into East Asia because that was technology policy. I was working with scientists and engineers and mathematicians all the time, uh, which I was glad to have the opportunity to do that, but I didn't want to do it for my entire career. So I had an opportunity to go out to CIA. I went out as a senior analyst. Uh, that's another story. I can go on a great length. I won't play it out. Suffice it to say, the, the job I had arranged and had been arranged for me and had been promised to me disappeared in a big reorganization. So I found myself doing things that I mm -hmm. would not have agreed to go out there to do if that's what I knew what I was in for, which is basically to be a desk-bound analyst, you know, staring at a computer screen all day. For, and for somebody who'd been on Capitol Hill, and in the hurly-burly of that, mm -hmm. uh, this was very claustrophobic, you know, very limiting. Anyway, I did that for two and a half years. Uh, talked to Tom Hughes at Carnegie Endowment, saying, "Tom, I need to get out of. I need. I need a, an escape." 
uh, a capsule, and he said, okay, come to the Carnegie Endowment. So I did that, senior associate. That was basically, I, I saw it as basically a transition short term. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a year, basically. Uh, was offered a position on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Meantime, I'd done some things at the National Academy of Sciences, sort of part-time. I'd done the Foreign Service Institute part-time. Mm -hmm. I was sort of, you know, dabbling. Mm -hmm. um, other things, too. Uh, but at any rate, so I end up back on Capitol Hill, this time Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, this is the 1980s, uh, better part of 10 years. Uh, it was a glorious time and a glorious place. Um, this was a period where you have to get into the weeds on this, and I won't. Suffice it to say, in my view, intelligence oversight, legislative oversight of the secret world of intelligence is an inherently very difficult and problematic enterprise. And it only works if it's done under absolutely optimal conditions by people who know exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that was true in the period I was there when David Bourne was chairman. It has not been true since. I mean, essentially it's been a dysfunctional relationship, ever, you know, basically since that time. But for that period it was terrific. So I had basically free run in the entire intelligence world and uh, learned a lot, uh, traveled a lot, uh, loved every minute of it. Uh, but when David Bourne then left the committee and retired, and Bill Cohen had been vice chairman, also left the committee and, re and retired, uh, I thought it was time to, for me to move, and I was then offered a faculty slot at the National, <coughs> excuse me, the National War College, mm -hmm. which prior to that I hardly had ever heard of. Well, I now find myself, this is back to Leinbarger's thing, about halfway between, <coughs> excuse me, the National War College is positioned about equidistant between the, the academic world as a teaching college and the policy world. Your students are 41, 42, 43 year old military officers, CIA, state, they're, they're professionals, and you are very closely plugged into the Pentagon, you're part of the Department of Defense, you have access to the Joint Chiefs staff and so on. So for somebody who wants to be one foot in the policy world, one foot in the academic world, this was pretty damn good. And so I stayed there for the better part of 20 years, 19 years. And eventually one of the personnel people told me, you know, you're working for nothing, just, just so you should, you should know that. I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you're under the old federal retirement system, which, you know, it's a federal pension, lifetime, all of that, and you accrue, you know, you basically mm -hmm. credit, you know, and you're at a point now where your take home as a retiree would be basically equal to what you're getting, right. you know, as a full-time employee. So, well, I, I really liked what I was doing, so I hung on for another year or two, but then some personalities changed, it became less pleasant, and it was just sort of okay. So at that point, then to finish the long soliloquy, uh, I'm now 70 years old, basically, and I'm retiring from the federal government, and I've got lots of things and having to do with home repair and that sort of stuff, and my wife's got a business, and I've got a house on an island in Maine, and we got a lot, there's plenty of ways for me to occupy my time, and I inform M, uh, my wife, uh, that this will be good, that's what I'll do, and she says, no, you've got to have some place to go, you got to get out of the house, you got to be on a you know, on a clock somewhere, um, or intellectually engaged, I think was the way she put it. But at any rate, so only in Washington, literally, pencil, back of an envelope, where would I like to be associated with in, if I had the option? First on the list was SICE, second was the Woodrow Wilson Center mm -hmm. downtown, uh, third was Brookings. Mm -hmm. I called the first two, both of them said, okay, uh, come join up. Um, so I ended up as an, you know, as fa visiting faculty, the titles keep changing, I don't have to lose track of what I'm actually called, but at any rate, I'm, uh, I'm a vis visiting professor at SICE in the Southeast Asia program, but I also, this was per just personal kind of, you know, little idiosyncr idiosyncratic impulse. I had read an article in the Hopkins Alumni Magazine, which is a very good mm -hmm. one, uh, back 2005, I think it was a June or July issue, at any rate, 
the, the teaser on the cover was, what's wrong with undergraduate education at Hopkins? And the gist of it was that Hopkins had been established as a, uh, on a template that was different than virtually any other American university. It was a German template, and it was all about professional schools, graduate programs, you know, doctoral, postdoc, all of this. And undergraduates were treated as sort of excess baggage. And ever since 1870, whatever, whenever Hopkins was established, that's the way we've done it. We get all these bright kids in, mm -hmm. and we treat them like sort of under, they're just underfoot. And the, mm -hmm. the gist of it being, we have got to change. And so Hopkins, they had a, they had a, uh, a university commission and so on. We're going to look at how to make the change. What struck me was the person who wrote up the article for the magazine went around the campus then buttonholing undergraduates saying, what's your experience been like? And the general reaction was lousy because nobody pays any attention to us. And then they went on to say frequently, it was a recurring refrain, I wish I had someone to talk to about. And it was mainly life mentoring career direction. What's it like to work for the federal government, say, in the Pentagon, on Capitol Hill, at the CIA, at the State Department, so on, so on, so on. And I read this, and my reaction was, heck, that's my resume. You know, and, and all these questions, I mean, I can, I can basically respond to almost all of these. I, and if, I, if there's a place I haven't worked, say, like the NSC, I know a lot of people who have. So, at any rate. So I then on my, you know, I just for the hell of it called up the main number at Hopkins and I had the name of the woman who had headed the university commission. And it turned out she was the dean of undergraduate education. So I <laughs> called her office and I introduced myself to the receptionist and, this, and so, so then, okay, the dean will come on the phone. And she, I explained, you know, I'm at the War College, I'm going to retire, this is who I am, this is why I'm calling. And she said, well, if you came on the campus, you'd have to teach a course. And I said, okay. And she said, what would it be? And I said, Southeast Asia. And she said, okay, someone will call you back. About an hour later from, from the head of the East Asia Studies program, I didn't know this, turns out it's a huge program at Homewood, got hundreds of kids enrolled. And it's sort of like, okay, when can you start? Well, uh, <laughs> part of the reason, the main reason was, I think, when you looked at the curriculum, it was China, 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 Japan, Korea, China, China, full stop. There, there was no Asia south of the Vietnam border. Um, and so I, I then just sort of show up and say, well, that's the part of Asia. So, so that would check a box for them. Mm -hmm. So I've done that now twice. So what exact, what countries do you focus on? Well, the south, it's the countries of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the ten countries. <coughs> Excuse me that make up the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, mm -hmm. Vietnam, Burma, mm -hmm. Thailand, so on, plus Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And I do basically an introductory course with a focus on, with an optic of, of how to see the region as a security strategist would see it. And that draws upon my 20 years at the War College. Mm -hmm. And so it's been fun. So I've done that twice. Uh, as near as I can tell, sort of all the returns indicate that students like it. Um, and I've also done, as I alluded to earlier, I told my class initially, I said, look, I've kicked around the federal government in a lot of different capacities. If you want to talk about, you know, these kinds of options, mm -hmm. I'm willing to do it, but you've got you to tell me. And so immediately, yes, we want to do that. So it was kind of cold pizza, meet with a bunch of students, you know, in the evening, all of that. And that then turned into, oh, that was great, let's do it for the whole campus. So then I did a second one. Mm -hmm. And now this time I did one for, you know, for basically international studies students. Um, and, uh, you know, the, as near as you can tell, why the reception was, there, you know, the interest was quite high. Good. Which is, you know, not surprising given sort of job realities and mm -hmm. everything else. Mm -hmm. Great. That's my story. Well, it's a great story, and and it's uh, it kind of brings me to the next question, which is where you are now, kind of looking back on your <clears throat> career and your continued career. What advice might you have for current students today? <clears throat> um, I don't know whether 
I mean, first of all, uh, size students don't really need any advice. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the kind of thing that I offer... They might differ well, in thinking. <laughs> uh, the, the kind of thing I offer to the undergraduates, I did because I thought there, you know, I had a lot of indication there was a real felt need for that amongst these kids who are sophomores, juniors, seniors, who are 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, for a SCI student who's already traveled a lot, has worked for two or three organizations abroad, who's now 27 years old, probably has a pretty good sense of where they're, where they're going or where they want to go. They don't need me to sit down and say, well, you know, here's, here's, what, here's the big world that's out there. Um, so I have not tried to do anything like that. Uh, have you found at SICE. students at SICE are looking for any of that or ask you questions? I've had a little bit of it. I've, I've, yeah. had, I've had a, a few students come in and say, I'd like to get your advice, you know, that sort of thing. But, but, uh, the, but I've, I've, not, I've not offered it, and I don't think, by, I think by and large, most students have a pretty clear idea what, where they're trying to go. Um, my, if, to the extent that I would offer any advice, it would be, uh, just going back to what I said earlier, um, and it would be fairly, uh, f you know, there would be nothing original about it. Uh, I guess the one that you think, thought that comes to mind, I did a Ph.D. That's not trivial. That takes a big bite out of your life. You don't, you don't sort of do that, oh, I think maybe I'll get a Ph.D. just for the heck of it. Uh, it, it, what, what the Ph.D. did, though, was it did what Paul Leinbarger advised me to do. It gave me options. It, create, it, it, it meant that I had two worlds that I could function in, uh, the academic world and the policy world. Now, it's a lot tougher today because the academic world, in terms of a job market, has been lousy for practically ever since I was in Mount Holyoke. So, you know, what the exact, and, and my impression is it's much harder now to get into Ph.D. programs, as it probably ought to be, because, you know, mm -hmm. you know what do you do with it once you get it, uh, than it used to be. But, but nevertheless, if you want to follow Paul Leinberger's advice, you don't, you know, there are people, and there are people on the science, adjunct, on the science faculty that, that will be an exception to this, but it is hard to, to, to be a sort of an academic faculty professor without the Ph.D. Uh, and there are, you know, there are a lot of foreign service officers, for example, that retire fairly early. They've had a lot of experience, and they like to teach, but they don't have the Ph.D. Well, I did all but the dissertation. Well, okay, but, you know, that sort of thing. So that's, that's worth thinking about now for some. I mean, for a lot, a lot I have no interest in going the academic group, but mm -hmm. for but for some who think they might want to have that arrow in their quiver, then that's worth thinking about. I guess the other thing is just you know my own experience, and it's back to that article on the on the airplane. Uh, I moved around a lot. Uh, you you to do that you have to be open. You have to have a certain built-in flexibility in your mindset. Uh, I went to work for the Office of Technology Assessment. I would never have dreamed of working at a place where all my colleagues were nuclear engineers and biochemists and so on. Mm -hmm. Never in my wildest fantasy. But that's, you know, that's what, what, I, what I found, and as I say, I, you know, it was terrific. So be open to the unexpected. Expect to be surprised. Mm -hmm. And be, you know, and look to be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that would be, you know, and expect to... To move around, and I guess the last thing, and I've always thought this, that uh, you, okay, you're interested in international affairs. I frankly don't even know whether you can be a generalist in international affairs at SICE. You used to be. You could just graduate with, you know, uh, MA from SICE in international affairs, full stop. I always thought, no, I, I don't want to, I want to have... A, a, I want to have a subcontract. I, I want to have some specialty that goes with that. In my case, it was area. It was Southeast Asia, and I, I, you know, I actually went through a rational sort of conversation with myself and process of elimination, and I decided this is my region. Uh, I've never regretted that, and I've stayed with it, you know, through the Vietnam War and post-Vietnam when most people left it, and I've never regretted that. 
but but for my case, it was international affairs plus a region. But I've always thought, and I've said it to the students at Hopkins, combine it with, you're interested in international affairs, great, combine it with something, agronomy, mechanical engineering, journalism, medicine, public health, mm -hmm. you know, finance, something. Go, go out there on the international market with, you know, I, I'm not just, I'm, you know, it, the number of people that decide they're interested in international affairs, whether they have any background in it or not, is legion. Mm -hmm. You need something, you need, yes, I have that, but I also have mm -hmm. this. So that's, that's it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.